my honor and privilege to be here and be your guest speaker today. Uh, Today I'll be speaking about mindfulness and its usefulness in the workplace. Um, First, I'm going to briefly share my experience finding mindfulness. Second, we'll discuss mindfulness, what it is and what it isn't, and its importance. And third, we'll examine how to bring mindfulness into the workplace. So let's get started. In 2004, I was getting my feet wet working in the travel programs department. For Kevin. Kevin was my boss and he taught me many things including diplomacy, budgets, and how to deal with challenges. But dealing with challenges was the hardest part. And Kevin would always say to me, James, you need to learn how to not let external circumstances affect your internal condition. And that's certainly easier said than done, but it became an ideal for me. Uh, something I I tried really hard to achieve, and um, it led me on a path to discovering mindfulness many years later. Uh, Last year, I was revising a course for Atlantic University called Religion, Spirituality, and the Transpersonal. Uh, It's set up for three weeks on each major world religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. After teaching the course a few times, I began to notice that the students were having difficulty grasping the concepts in Buddhism especially Zen. So I started reading more and more books on Zen, and I found that Zen asked the question, what does it mean to truly live life? I became inspired by uh, two authors in particular, Alan Watts and Thich Nhat Hanh. Alan Watts said, this is the real secret of life, to be completely engaged with what you are doing in the here and now. And instead of calling it work, Realize it is play. What he's describing is mindfulness, but I didn't know that until I read Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Zen master from the Vietnamese tradition. I found his book, The Miracle of Mindfulness. And in this book, Thich Nhat Hanh tells the story that really hit close to home for me. He was visiting with his friend who had a young child. The child demanded the full attention of his parents. As most of you know, I have a 14-month-old child. (laughs) Thich Nhat Hanh asked his friend, do you find family life easy? The friend answered by describing the demands of being a new parent, the lack of sleep, the fear of the child's health and safety, no time for oneself, and hardly any time with his spouse. Thich Nhat Hanh kind of nodded and said, is family life easier than being a bachelor? His friend thought for a moment, kind of weighing both sides, didn't really answer. Thich Nhat Hanh said, a lot of people say that if you have a family, you're less lonely and have more security. Is that true? Again, his friend answered kind of the same way, but he could tell he was thinking. And then his friend said, I've discovered a way to have a lot more time. In the past, I used to look at my time as if it were divided into several parts. One part I reserved for my child, another was for my wife, Another was for my job, another for household work, and so on. The time left over, I considered my own time. I could then read, write, do research, go for walks, whatever. But now, I try not to divide time into parts anymore. I consider my time with my son and my wife as my own time. When I help my son with his homework, I try to find ways of seeing his time as my own time. I go through his lessons with him, sharing his presence, and finding ways to be interested in what we do during that time. The time for him becomes my own time, the same with my wife. The remarkable thing is that now I have unlimited time for myself. When I read this passage, it just blew my mind. I had been exhausting myself and giving my time and my energy to my newborn baby, to my wife, to my job, to the household, to teaching, and so on. So in a way, this book, The Miracle of Mindfulness, helped me to own my life situation and to be fully present in the moment-to-moment activities instead of thinking about the challenge while acting. So what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is uniting our awareness or our attention with our action. Thich Nhat Hanh said, when we are mindful, deeply in touch with the present moment, our understanding of of what is going on deepens. And we begin to be filled with acceptance, joy, peace, and love. 
that's giving full attention to the present moment. John Cobbett Zinn is a medical doctor who has done decades of research on the positive health benefits of mindfulness, specifically the reduction of stress. And he likes to call mindfulness falling awake. And further, cultivating intimacy with our inner being. Mindfulness is not being zoned out. It's not avoiding the past. And it's not avoiding planning for the future. Mindfulness is knowing what we are doing while we're doing it. It's awareness. And it's a practice just like meditation, but this practice can be utilized all the time. The importance of mindfulness is that it allows us to be our authentic selves. Most of us live our lives with our minds very full, multitasking, to-do lists, phone calls, emails, colleagues come in and out of our workplace, and our own inner thoughts, our reflections, our dreams. You know, most of us live moment for moment. We walk the dog to go make dinner, to go watch a movie, to go to bed, to wake up the next morning, to go to work. To, you know, we're always living for the next thing, moment for moment. But mindfulness asks us to live moment to moment. We walk the dog to walk the dog. You wash the dishes to wash the dishes. You work to work, not to go home. You know, there's this Zen saying, I'm sure most of you have heard it, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. But now you can kind of see the difference there. Zen likes to hide it and make you go look for it. Well, that's the difference. Mindfulness helps us to be our genuine selves and live the highest ideals that we've set for ourselves. So how can we be, how can we bring mindfulness into the workplace? How can we do that? Well, we need some training. We can't just say, I'm going to do it and then do it. So I went on some training. This past August, I went to a five-day mindfulness retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh, 90 of his monks and nuns, and 900 other people just like myself up in the mountains of Colorado. We practiced mindful eating. You know, normally when we sit down to eat, we talk, we socialize, um, and we might focus on the taste of the food. This is very good, it's very bad, but that's really it. We just, you know, do that. But with mindful eating, we take a bite, set down our fork, and be aware of our chewing, our action, and what we're chewing in gratitude. It seems so simple, but it really clears your mind. And I'm normally a f very fast eater, and eating slowly, I never went hungry. <laughs> we practice mindful walking. Have you ever walked just to walk? Some people shaking their heads. One person shook their head. You know, a 14-month-old daughter, it took us over a year to learn how to walk. And we have full control of our legs. You know, we don't even have to barely think about it. Full command. Go sit down. Go over here. Go over there. Get up. Faster. Hurry up. But we really take that for granted. With mindful walking, we focus on each step. Our foot is touching the earth. That's the Zen principle there. Each step. And we used a mantra, I have arrived, I am home, with each step. The idea there is the present moment awareness. And we utilize the breath. Breathing in, I'm taking three steps. Breathing out, I'm taking four steps, and so on. Then we practiced mindful meditation, which is watching each breath. Thich Nhat Hanh reminds us that breath is the bridge which connects life to consciousness, which unites your body to your thoughts. Whenever your mind becomes scattered, use your breath as a means to take hold of your mind again. Getting in touch with our breathing can really lead to some profound insights. Over the past year, I witnessed the final breath of my mother and the first breath of my child. Yet I am breathing all the time. Thich Nhat Hanh reminds us that your breathing should flow gracefully, like a river, like a water snake crossing the river, and not like a chain of rugged mountains or the gallop of a horse. To master our breath is to be in control of our bodies and minds. Each time we find ourselves dispersed and find it difficult to, get, to gain control of ourselves by different means, the method of watching the breath should be used. 
The breath is the easiest way to come back to the present moment. We recognize our breathing and hit reset and focus on our attention on what we're doing. So the trainings of mindful walking, mindful eating, mindful breathing provide a method of practice that we can use when we come into the more challenging aspects of life, especially work. But we're only as good as our practice. Edgar Cayce reminds us that it's in the application, it's in the doing, that comes the knowing and the understanding. We have to practice. So it's mindfulness in the workplace. Let's revisit Kevin's advice to me as a young 24-year-old. I will not let external circumstances affect my internal condition. So let's imagine a scenario. <clears throat> let's imagine we have a writing deadline or any a deadline that works for you. But for this instance, a writing deadline. We have to write creative and inspiring text for a new brochure. And we're driving into work, thinking and planning to finalize the text this morning. It's been nagging us for weeks. We get into our work area, and we spill our coffee all over the place. Our colleague comes over and helps us, but then begins chatting away, talking about last night and this other thing and so on, and taking up more and more of your time that you had already planned to use. Then you log into your Outlook account, and you've got 50 emails that haven't been read. Then you get a call from your spouse about a bill that just came in, you know, and then you check and see that five of the emails are from your boss that need your attention right now, and you've got an email from finance. And then the boss calls, asking about one of the emails that you haven't even read yet. <laughs> so what do we do? What do we do? It didn't advance. There we go. We accept it as our own time. This is my time. We recognize our breathing, we bring our awareness back into the present moment. And we prioritize and actively plan for our order of execution. Respond to the boss, manage the finance, write the creative text, meet that deadline, and move on. What we remove is all of that extra thinking, all those extra thoughts like, are you serious? You know, <laughs> why does this all have to happen to me? It's just my luck, you know? This is just too much for anyone to handle. Or even, I'm not getting paid enough to deal with this. <laughs> and some of us take this from thoughts to actions, and we start venting to our colleagues and our family and my friends, and we just escalate the issue. And we go on down this road of escalation. But Thich Nhat Hanh reminds us, at any moment, you have a choice that either leads you closer to your spirit or further away from it. It reminds me of Plato's statement that the first and best victory is to conquer self. Edgar Casey said, He that mastereth self is greater than he that taketh a city. Master self in the present. So in conclusion, with practice and our full attention, we can maintain our calm equilibrium, live up to our ideal, and not let external situations affect our internal conditions. Thank you.